good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. I love the enthusiasm already. Um, I am Brittany McGee. I'm the next generation officer here at the council, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the April Young Professionals Program. Um, a week out from Earth Day, we're in for a fantastic discussion on the commercialization of space. Um, we're in great company as well this evening um, as our friends from the Adler Planetarium have joined us. Um, a special welcome to you and thank you so much for your partnership in helping us build this program. Most of you know the house rules by now, but for our guests and newcomers, tonight's program is um, on the record and being live streamed, so please silence your phones, but keep them at the ready um, as we'll be taking questions through our online survey technology, the link to which you can find on the screen on either side of me. Simply type chi.cnf.io into your device browser and select tonight's program to um, submit your question for consideration. We very much welcome your engagement with us on social media and encourage you to tag hashtag CouncilYP in your posts. However, as you're tweeting, know that views expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the council. For nearly a century, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs has provided an independent nonpartisan platform for a variety of different voices to pr promote deeper global engagement and active um, understanding of the global issues in the world. We engage not only the nation and world's top leaders, but also Chicago's next generation of leaders with programming to increase your global fluency and cultural competence. I encourage you, if you are not yet a member with us, to consider joining and participating in our Young Professionals Network. And I'm so happy to see a lot of our YPs in the audience tonight. To find out more about joining um, council membership, please see myself um, or other council staff um, following the program. Back to tonight's program. 10 days ago, Elon Musk tweeted, this is gonna sound crazy, but SpaceX will try to bring rocket upper stage back from orbital velocity using a giant party balloon and then land on a bouncy house. To crack that cryptic code and elucidate for us if recent interest and massive personal investment by corporate entrepreneurs is a case of boys with big wallets playing with galactic toys or a trend-setting shift of space exploration from the, private se from the public sector to commercial operation. That is what our esteemed panel will discuss. To introduce them briefly, Dr. Deborah Barnett, Bar Barnhart, pardon me, is the president of the U.S. Space and Rocket Center located in Huntsville, Alabama. She is the recipient, recipient of NASA's Distinguished Public Service Medal, and Deborah holds a master's in business administration from MIT and a doctorate from Vanderbilt University. Christian Davenport is an author and staff writer at the Washington Post, where he covers the space and defense industries. Christian's new book, Space Barons, Elon Musk, Jeff uh, Bezos, and the Quest to Colonize the Cosmos, will be available for purchase just right over here um, from our partners at the book seller, seller and signing following the program. So please make sure um, that you check out Christian's book. Christian is also a former public policy fellow at the Wilson Center's Digital Futures Project. And moderating tonight's discussion is Michelle Larson. Michelle Larson is the president and CEO of the Adler Planetarium. She's previously held positions in science engagement at several universities, including Utah State University, the Pennsylvania State University, and University of California, Berkeley. Michelle holds a PhD from Montana State University. I will return to moderate the Q&A following our discussion, but until then, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our far out panel. <laughs> Well, terrific. We're, we're happy everyone could be here tonight, and we're looking forward to this conversation. We're going to talk a lot about the business of space exploration and the private and public um, partnership and all of those different things. So I think we have some great panelists here to offer some insight. I thought um, we could start by thinking about, we often say an evolution, as was said in the introduction, from public exploration of space to this kind of corporate adventure. But I'd be interested in your thoughts on whether or not you see it as an evolution from one to the other, or if there's a bit of a cooperation that might be happening there, or what's the, what's the role or the balance between the two? Christian, you want to start? Sure. I mean, I think the era that we're in now, and this is what I was trying to document in, in the book, 
really is much more of a collaboration between uh, NASA and the federal government and this growing commercial sector. Um, and if you look at the, the arc of America's space program, right from the very beginning with the Mercury program and Gemini and Apollo and the space shuttle, and now I kind of think this is, uh, you know, the sort of the commercial space era in a way, and where NASA, you know, led the way really under the Bush administration and saying we want to get out of low Earth orbit, you know, meaning servicing the International Space Station, which is about 250 miles up, and we're going to rely on the private sector, you know, contractors to do that, to essentially provide us with a taxi service flying cargo and supplies to the space station. Uh, under President Obama, they doubled down on that and said, you know what, we're going to have you guys fly not just cargo and supplies, but human beings as well, and really trusting them. And the idea is that NASA then frees up those resources to go explore deep space. But now, under the Trump administration, you're hearing talk about going back to the moon, but doing it in partnership with industry. So yeah, I mean, I think it's a significant turning point. I think they recognize that it's hard to get out into space without bringing everyone in, all types of industry and all types of even international partners. And Deborah, you worked in the space hardware arena for quite a long time. And so talk a little bit about the evolution or the, the, the way in which this partnership has evolved from the time you were doing that to now. Sure. Well, being one of the few people in the room who was, you know, alive and a teenager when we landed on the moon, you know, I can, I can go back a little further than Christian perhaps. I mean, when you think back to the days when Khrushchev was saying, uh, we will bury you, and a young John Kennedy was at Rice University saying, you know, we, we decided to go to the moon and return a man safely to Earth within this decade. You know, those were very disparate um, allegiances to try to go to the moon. It was a space race, and it was deadly serious back in those days, and in some cases, you know, really deadly serious. Uh, as children in those days, we were, you know, ducking and covering on our desks to, to avoid nuclear war. I mean, it was, it was, you know, a really different time. And then I think, you know, of course, winning that space race, so to speak, um, I think then eventually seeing uh, the acid test came for the U.S., I think, when we started our Space Station Freedom Program, because when we were first talking about doing our own American Space Station, it was a program called Space Station Freedom. It was an American Space Station. It was, once again, you know, Americans conquered space. And then we quickly realized that it was very difficult to do that by yourself. It was too expensive for us to do it. And then, of course, technologically, we, we had to get the Russians to help us to get the first modules up and so forth. And now, you know, we've had... You know, anybody who's 18 years old here, you know, we've had somebody living in space station your whole life. And now there are 15 nations there on the space station. You know, I think from here on, it is a conjoined effort. It's not us and them anymore. It's not our country and other countries. It's not NASA and commercial guys. It's not us and them. It's we now. It literally is we. And I like the way Dan Dumbarker uh, expressed it the other day. He's the head of AIAA nationally. He said, you know, it's kind of like when you look at aviation and you had the early guys and the single flyers and the people who were setting records, and then eventually, you know, it was barnstorming. And people all over the country were like seeing them and knowing what it was and having some relationship with those aircraft. I think we're at that barnstorming phase now where everybody's accepting it, it's becoming part of our culture, part of our life, and part of our industry. One quick note on that. So in, uh, in 1903 was the first Wright Brothers powered flight. By 1955, there were more Americans in the United States flying by commercial airline than were taking the railroad, right? And that started with, you know, commercial aviation just took off. And, you know, within a generation or two, we were flying because you had World War I in the post office and these barnstormers. And now you're kind of seeing it's not a perfect analogy, um, but, I th but I think there is something there about that, you know, government is involved, and they're still very involved. I mean, we talk about you know, Elon Musk and all of the things he's done to disrupt the industry. The fact of the matter is that SpaceX does not exist really without NASA yeah. and the hundreds of millions, really billions, many billions of dollars that NASA has invested in SpaceX so that it could develop the technology to first take crew to the International Space Station and then now uh, hopefully, or cargo, and then hopefully crew. Yeah. So let, let's talk about that just a little bit more, which is the role of the disruptor, right? So you have this uh, idea that we were trying to race to go to the moon, and we had that pressure to get there, and we just kind of plotted along in a, in a very purposeful way, but we got there. Now we're in this era where 
the disruption is what's kind of moving things forward. Does that necessarily need to be outside of the original industry the way it has been with these guys? But then I'm gonna play off of you saying, but Elon doesn't exist without NASA. So he's the disruptor, right. but then he's also supported. So let's talk about that a little bit. So, you know, let's, t you know, we can talk about the economics of it, but I'll, I'll talk for a minute just culturally mm -hmm. about it, right? There was a lot of concern and a lot of criticism of NASA that they got risk averse, particularly after uh, the two shuttle disasters. And even though they get, a, you know, take a lot of flack, the fact of the matter is that, you know, it's, Congress has limited their funding. One president says we're going to the moon, then another one says we're going to Mars. So they kind of get jerked around in different directions. But let me just tell a quick, quick story about Elon and the way SpaceX operates or did and how that there's that sort of cultural tension with sort of a big government bureaucracy. So on, I think it was the second or third flight of their Falcon 9 rocket, which is their big main rocket, they did an inspection of it and found that in the second stage engine, in the skirt or this nozzle that goes around the engine, there was a crack. And so if you're NASA or you know almost any other company, what do you do? You pull the rock down, you take it apart, you inspect it, you look at your manufacturing procedures, you're down maybe out of the count for months. Elon says, well, what if we just cut around the crack? Like if it's you know crack on your fingernail and you just clip it off. And they're like, what is he, crazy? And they, you know, sit around, they do the math, they say, well, since it's in the second stage, we've got, you know, the booster's going to get us into space, this is just putting us into the right orbit. Go around the table, they do the math, they're like, yeah, go, go fly, like, it, it, you know, we can do it. So they fly a guy from California to Florida that night with like a pair of shears, and they cut it, and they flew the next day, right? So that's the kind of speed and innovation. They're not gonna do that when they're human beings on board, but you wanna talk about a development program and like moving fast, mm -hmm. you know, that's a way to NASA, they would never do anything like that. And I wanna to touch on that in a minute, but you look yeah. like you wanted to also talk a little bit about I think it's really important for everyone to realize that all this commercial space work is being funded by NASA. I mean, now they're doing their own offshoots and their own testing and their own, you know, new models and designs and so forth. But they all had to get their start with government funding. It's, you know, it's like any other great invention of our country. Those things are too expensive for any one company to do. And so our government comes together to make these big leaps forward. So you have to keep that in mind. Now, as we go forward, I mean, commercialization is the space imperative. For space to work, for us to colonize, for us to go back to the moon, even space station, when we first started with International Space Station, the whole idea was it was going to be a place where we were going to make really pure crystals, you know, crystals without flaw. We were going to grow them massively for industry, and we were going to make pharmaceuticals, you know, better and cleaner and finer than we'd ever made before. And it was going to be a big commercial thing. And even now, we're still struggling to try to make space commercializable, you know. And until we have that economic imperative, until there is a profit motive, for us to be able to maintain ourselves in space for long periods of time, only then will it become truly commercial when there is a profit incentive that can be gained by someone. But okay, I, I, I hear you on that. So let's come back to this idea that NASA and the government is actually funding this because it's not commercializable just yet. The attitude and the methods of these startups is more of a disruptive. But is that distance necessary for the public to be accepting of clipping around the crack when they don't necessarily relate it so much to their own dollars that are being treated that way? What do you mean by distance? So we often hear that the government needs to be a bit more cautious because it's taxpayer dollars that they're spending. And I'm trying to probe here on whether or not there's this, the government's still funding it, but the public's in love with the entrepreneurial spirit of those that are doing it, and is that a distance that's critical to allow them to take the risks that they're taking without criticism? It's a question. I'd say yes and no. Um, you know, by operating in that public-private partnership you know, where SpaceX was allowed to sort of develop the rocket the way they wanted to develop it, and yeah, they had to meet specs that were laid out by NASA, and NASA was involved in it. They let them have some freedom uh, to do that. Um, but, you know, uh, Elon and Jeff and all these guys say that they stand on the shoulders of NASA, mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. right? There's been uh, decades of experience that they're trying to harness. And they hire a lot of people from, you know, more traditional companies from NASA who've, who've had that. You know, so it's not like they went off on their own totally and just came up with a rocket. They're they're leaning on decades mm -hmm. of experience. So one thing I I, I do want to note: while SpaceX takes a lot of money, uh, Blue Origin has had very little government money. There, I mean, but then again, he's got an, a bank named Amazon. That's right, <laughs> yeah. 110 yeah. billion dollars. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> And it has, you know, he's the wealth of a, of a nation. And does that afford them any other freedoms because they're self-funded, do you think? Or are they also, in what way, Deborah? Well, I mean, you, somebody asked Jeff last year at the Space Symposium, Christian and I were just at, and uh, they said, I is it true that Amazon is a thinly veiled banking for um, your rocket interest to Blue Origin? said, absolutely, you know, <laughs> keep buying and now we're raising it 20 bucks, right? So, yeah, no, I, I mean, I think it's fine. I think it's astonishing that a guy like Elon would, uh, you know, get his money from PayPal. I think he was one of the partners to PayPal, and he got something like, and Christian, you can correct me, something like $486 million when he sold out. And to think, I mean, think if you had that money in your hand from selling your company and decide, I want to build a rocket company. So I think that internal desire is what's astonishing about these guys. You know, not that they can do the contracting with NASA and do these various technical things, but they had the will and the desire to bet it all. Because Elon bets the whole house on his on his enterprises. I think it's amazing. Yeah, and you see, and what's interesting too, because they all have different interests, right? Elon had PayPal, and he's got Tesla and the Boring Company, and he also tweeted that he's going to build a cyborg dragon. I don't know anything about that, <laughs> um, but but I think for him, you know, space is and and SpaceX is central. And again, with Jeff, you know, Amazon, and he owns the Washington Post. Uh, my employer, but I, I think that Blue Origin and Space is his real passion. And when I was talking to him to try to get him to participate in the book, I said, everyone sees you through the lens of Amazon. I think to understand you, we have to see you through the lens of, of space. I mean, it's a real passion for them. And it's that passion and that adventure and all of that push that drives them to do something that's inherently quite risky. But I don't wanna, I don't wanna undersell either what they've accomplished. Elon has disrupted three industries entirely entirely. I mean, the automotive industry, the rocket industry, and the energy industry. And then he's about to do the vacuum tube, whatever he's going to do with Boring Company. But I mean, w when you look at United Launch Alliance, which now makes the Atlas and Delta rockets, which are your rockets for this nation, those are our heavy lift vehicles. And the two rockets are now going to come together. The next generation will be called the Vulcan rocket. If Elon hadn't landed the first stage successfully, as you saw, that beautiful moment, you know, when they came down first and then when he landed at both of them, if he hadn't done that, no way would ULA be talking about recovering their first stage. So this disruption is very healthy for an old, stodgy space industry, if I can say that. And, you know, having worked in that industry most of my life, you know, we got pretty complacent being government contractors and kind of moving along in the military industrial complex at this certain pace. And these expectations of government funding for these innovations in R&D. And to see the beauty of a person disrupting that, even with the government's money, it's a very this good This is what thing. I was trying to get at earlier, which it's is a very how, good thing. what's the magic there and why is there this appetite and ability to disrupt and is there any way we can digest some of that into the more staunch mm -hmm. conservative pieces so that they could do it as well. All right, so earlier we talked about the cultural difference, now we can talk about the economic one. What Elon and SpaceX saw was the, the United Launch Alliance. So the United Launch Alliance is Lockheed Martin and Boeing, right? The big guys in a joint venture together that had a lock a monopoly on all Pentagon launches. Anytime the Pentagon or the intelligence community want to launch a satellite to space, they had that. And they were charging a lot of money. And Elon said, there's a lot of money to be made here. We can do it, and we can do it for much cheaper. And they, they sued to, to enter it. Now, this is interesting. I mean, what company sues? He sued the Air Force for the right to compete for these contracts. So the government agency that he wants as his customer, he takes him to court. Right, that shows you a little bit how Elon operates, but you know, eventually there's a settlement, uh, and he does come in cheaper, 
and ULA, the big guys, has to totally reorganize. They get a new CEO, Tori Bruno, who, who says, you know, I'm going to literally transform the company. We're going to build this new Vulcan rocket. But I love how he iterates. So he says, you don't need to fly the whole stage back and land it, which is what SpaceX does. So what you want out of the first stage are the engines. The rest is just a tube and, and propellant. So they're going to drop the engines out, and they're going to have a helicopter, and they'll, they'll have a parachute, and a helicopter is going to go by with a hook and snatch them up, right? So it's not the same kind of innovation that mm -hmm. Elon's doing, but yet you know it's a creative a way to save money nonetheless. But yeah. believe me, it's lighting a fire under, a fire under the old guys. It, it is, and it's a good thing for all of us. For, from a taxpayer point of view, from a, from a community and culturally moving forward the standard faster than it would have moved previously, it's, it's a new echelon, and I think it's very healthy. Good. We mentioned also about how there's a lot of talent that's being swapped between the old guys, as you called them, and the, the tried and true that have the experience, and they're coming in and being recruited by these, but then there's a lot of young talent that's also coming into this new space age and working for these companies. Is there, do you, either of you have any sense if there's a competition for talent? Is there enough talent to go around? Is there extra talent needed? And if so, where? How's that talent pool working? My sense is that, I mean, there's enormous competition. There's a competition among, you know, Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin and SpaceX, but also among Boeing and Lockheed and NASA. And my sense is that, no, there's not enough talent. They, they want more, and that you see them investing in, uh, you know, STEM programs and really do want more engineers. And, and, and you know, the, the irony is, like, this is, like, one of the most interesting times in the last uh, at least decade or so you know, I mean, it's such an enormous time, and there's this huge demand for talent, is what I hear. There was a lot of credit given to the Apollo era for feeding the coffers of NASA engineers that are all now retiring right. because it was a national, you know, pride to, to go there. Then there was a lull for a while about that kind of national interest in space. Is maybe this new era of corporate space interest fueling another wave of people being interested in working in that you area? You know you're in my wheelhouse now, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're partners with the Adler at the Space and Rocket Center. And of course, Space and Rocket Center is home of US Space Camp. So you know we've graduated 800,000 people. And that's children, adults, people from all over the world, 150 countries, all 50 states. In 36 years of this program that is Space Camp, at a NASA visitor center, so it's quite authentic. The work that we do there is all based on you know, NASA training and the real vehicles. Many of our simulators are the hardware that has come out of the program, the engineering models and so forth. So my life is the development of this workforce, and we desperately need it. We need it not only uh, in the aerospace community, but we need to use the aerospace dream to stimulate young people to get into STEAM subjects so that I don't care whether they become astronauts or not. But we needed this inspiration. We need to light this fire of inspiration in young people with space travel so that we can fill the coffers of all of these other technical areas. Cyber, there's a terrible dearth. Cyber, y'all. <laughs> I mean, every industry, banking, energy, you know, we're going to desperately need more people than we have coming in through the pipeline. Aviation. We don't have enough mechanics, we don't have enough pilots, you know, robotics, all of the technologies that are developing through the aerospace programs we need throughout industry in our, in our nation. So lighting that fire of imagination is my full-time job. Awesome. And, and these guys know this. They know it's so important to inspire people and to make space, like, frankly, cool and interesting again. Early on, one of the things that Elon wanted to do, before it ever even launched a rocket or even you know, really had gotten SpaceX started, one of his first ideas was, well, I'm going to go to Mars, and I want to fly a plant and have this plant be on Mars. So it's a living thing on Mars. You've got this you know, green sprout against you know, the, the orange uh, of Mars, and that'll be cool. That'll get really people fired up. And you know, I mean, he, he never did that. But, you know, and I was one of the reporters when he, you know, with, flew the Falcon Heavy and put that Tesla, you guys remember mm -hmm. the Tesla that went in with Starman the mannequin? And I was like, this is another Elon stunt. I mean, can't you find a scientific payload? Couldn't some students put something together? And is this a responsible use of space? And then you saw that and that image, and you're like, OK. It captured the imagination. It captured the imagination. It was yeah. like the, you know, the Earthrise photograph, right, from the Apollo era for the millennial generation mm -hmm. in a way, right? And he's, he's really sort of 
got people's interest in space. Well, there, there's by, a, by way of full disclosure, I'm a Tesla driver and I freaking loved it. I mean, I love <laughs> seeing Rocket Man out there. And then we, a couple of weeks ago, we went and put my Tesla on this lunar crater that we have at the Space and Rocket Center. And we tweeted it over and said, hey, Elon, first Tesla arrives on the lunar surface. Very <laughs> nice. I, I love it. I love it. Whatever inspires and makes us all happy and makes us more interested and more enthusiastic about it, I think it's all good. Well, this is a long game, right? So that's the other thing is it's a long game to go into space. It's a long game to do the stages that he's been doing. And there's some level of this capturing the imagination and the interest that I think keeps people along for the ride as we're needing to spend all of that time. These guys have their bazillions, as we talked about. They didn't have to choose space. They could have chose the depths of the ocean. They could have chose you know, the dryness of the desert. They could have gone in a volcano instead. Thoughts on why space? Why are we now finding ourselves 50 years later returning to space as that inspiration? Well, the, the, for these guys in the long vision, like the, you know, we talk a lot about Elon and it's funny because a lot of people don't even realize Jeff Bezos has a space company, I think. Right. But now, because they've been so secretive, he actually founded it in 2000, so two years before SpaceX. Um, but, but you know, what Jeff talks about, Elon says, we got to go to Mars in case anything happens to the Earth. We have sort of a plan B. If there's an asteroid that hits the Earth and humanity goes extinct like the dinosaurs, we need sort of a backup to the humanity hard drive on another planet. Jeff says... Mars is really, you know, it's, he says it's like, if you want to know what Mars is like, go to Antarctica because Antarctica makes Mars look like a garden paradise. What he wants to do is to go out into space and really have all heavy industry up in space. But he's talking like hundreds of years out and where he's mining asteroids, get, getting solar energy, doing manufacturing in space, sending those resources back to Earth. Resources on Earth are limited population's growing, demand for resources is growing. At some point, you know, there's going to be a, you know, we're going to have to go out into space, this is Jeff's vision, to be able to sort of keep our quality of life. Mm -hmm. And he talks about how Earth should be um, zoned residential, right? And that all the heavy industry goes off into space and, and it's brought back. Now, that's hundreds of years out. According to Elon, you know, we're, Mars is right around the corner, but I think that's a long way out too. But the key to get there is to make space you know, more affordable, more accessible, more routine. Now it's just too hard, and that's what these guys want to do as the first step. And they're making real progress in that regard. Governments don't have that timeline, right? Governments don't have that. We're going to need to build all our resources out into space. And so is that a necessary component of this private investor that's making this happen, is that they can just stick with it because it's their vision alone, and they don't have to? Well, this is, this is an area in which I disagree with Elon. Elon's attitude is, as Christian said, you know, oh, we're screwing up this planet pretty good and pretty fast, and so we're going to have to have a way out of here. I disagree with him. I think, fundamentally, it doesn't really matter who gets to Mars first. It's going to take, the long game is a really good way to put it, it's going to take so much evidence. Even Warner von Braun, back in the late 60s, when he wrote a book about the Red Planet, he thought it would take 259 missions of heavy lift going to Mars before we could even hope to have a base there. So I, I think realizing that Mars is 36 million miles away at its closest approach, I mean, it is, as they say at NASA, Mars is hard. It is hard. It is hard. And it doesn't really matter who gets there first if Elon, you know, drops something down there. It's going to take everybody we have on the whole planet to make that work. And I think it, it is very important for people in this audience to understand that we're going back to the moon first, for sure, or as they call it, cislunar. We're going, you know, at and around the moon. The next big program now is called Gateway, and it's kind of putting a small uh, human-tended space station, if you will, in the vicinity of the moon that you could go up and down from there to the moon. You could move this little space station around. You could go over and check out asteroids or do some mining. It's kind of a local camping trip, you know? It's like if we were gonna go camping, we wouldn't go to Grand Canyon for 20 days. You know, we might go to our local state park first or out in the backyard for a night or two, and then maybe to the state park, and then we you know, might go on a big adventure. It is such a difficult task. Life support and life sustaining in space. Rockets, no problem. And I, I think Christian would agree with me. We can get pretty much anywhere we wanna get in the, plant, in the solar system, you know, pretty easily. 
but living and sustaining life there, feeding ourselves, generating oxygen, recycling water. And this is where I disagree with Elon. I think the technologies that we must develop to sustain life on the moon or on Mars are the technologies we need to save the planet here. Pure water, clean air, good telemedicine. All of those are those technologies that are coming in the wake of space exploration that are critical to re retaining life on Earth. Right. As Jeff agrees with you, I think. He says plan B should be to make sure plan A works. Yes. And plan, yeah. plan A is yeah. Earth. I mean, Earth is a pretty, yeah. you know, we had a beautiful day here in Chicago walking around. I was at the Cubs game last night. You know, Earth is all right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> let's, let's save it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Very good point. Yeah. You mentioned that at NASA, um, Mars is hard. Is anything too hard? I don't think there's anything out of our reach. I mean, those life support, you know, environmental control and life support issues are the hardest issues. So those people that are working on those things, carbon dioxide removal, oxygen generation, water purification, food growth, imagine how difficult it would be for us to grow enough food for the people in this room for a month. I mean, it would take, it would take some doing, you know, and then recycling our waste and so forth. So it, it's going to be hard. It's going to be a hard challenge, and it's going to take the best minds we have. No, that's a good task. Final question before we go on to um, questions and answers from the audience, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on whether or not you would go if commercialized space flight gets to a point where anyone can buy a ticket and get up there. Would that be something you'd participate in? Not on the first flight, <laughs> is what I said. <laughs> <laughs> I want him to test it a little bit. Uh, I actually, on a, on a suborbital trip, and I, I when I met with uh, uh, Jeff Bezos, when I met with Richard Branson, who also wants to do suborbital tourism flights, I said, if your goal is to, to really to open up space and to make it accessible to ordinary people. Now, it's not quite for Virgin Galactic. It's $250,000 a ticket. It's, you know, not everyone can afford that, but they're hoping the price will come down. Jeff hasn't announced what uh, Blue Origin's price would be. Uh, but I said to them, I think if you, you need to have a journalist in space, you need to have. Uh, <laughs> so I would like to go. And, and I met with them. Um, uh, Bob Smith, the CEO of Blue Origin, at the Space Symposium, and he totally agreed with me, and so he's on the record oh, for good. that. And I'm right. repeating Way it to go, at Christian. the Chicago That's Council good. that they need yeah. to. But he said, look, yeah, but we need artists mm -hmm. and uh, poets and ballerinas, all kinds of people yeah, to go, one. right? Because there's only something like 550, Agreed. 560 people who have ever been mm -hmm. to space and seen that. So I, I do think that you know, if they're doing it safely, then I would certainly want to go. All right. Well, I have the next best thing to go into space every day when I go to work. So I have Space Camp. We have five or six simulators. We already have Orion capsules. We already have Starliners. We have a water tank to train, just like the astronauts do in the microgravity environment of water. So I have a lot of opportunity to get ready to go. Frankly, I mean, I'll be 66 next month, and I frankly expect to travel in space in my lifetime. I do not think it'll be a lunar or Mars mission. I have no interest in getting a Volkswagen with four or five other people and going for a month. I, I, what I want to do is go and hop on probably, you know, um, Space 2, maybe. Mm -hmm. I want to go and have a couple of take off and have a couple of orbital sunrises and sunsets and then come home for cocktails. <laughs> and I expect to do it in my lifetime. Yeah, that's a pretty nice I, I plan. think I will. That's great. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. I think that we're lucky to have those that do want to be on the first flight. You know, that's part sure. of this is that there's risk involved and there are people that are willing and wanting to do the risky part. And then there's also an industry of people that want to come and follow and that's the, yeah. the business model, and right? And let's not downplay that because there was a fatal crash in 2014 of the Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2 and for all of the, you know, hoopla around Elon and Jeff, the fact of the matter is they've never flown a human being. Right, that hasn't right. happened yet, so, right. and that's a big challenge. It is, yeah, yes. definitely. One of my favorite cartoons in life, however, in support of man's space, and what Christian says is absolutely true, but there's a cartoon that shows two oxen pulling a Conestoga wagon that's empty, and it says, early pioneers send unmanned probes to settle the <laughs> West. <laughs> so, you know, people are good. Human space is a good thing. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Well, we will uh, begin our question and answer a portion of the program. We invite you to ask questions to all three of our speakers. Um, 
You still have time to submit your questions online. Again, you can go to chi.cnf.io to submit a question online, but we'll also be taking some questions from in the room. There are folks walking around with mics, so all that um, I ask is that you wait for, uh, wait to be called on, wait for a mic, and please make sure that your question is actually a question. We will <laughs> start off right here on the right. Hot chick. All right. There you go. Uh, for the full panel, um, you guys talk a lot about public-private partnerships, but in uh, your description, it, it almost seems like a one-way street, where it's like the government, they provide the funding. Government is oftentimes the talent pool that then goes into the private industry. What is the return on investment for the government on the other side, or, or what are they doing in, in regards to acquisition reform that they're actually able to utilize some of these evolving technologies that are coming out of uh, um, um, the, these, these amazing companies? Well, they have a service to the space station now that they didn't have. Uh, you know, people forget, and then if they're able, Boeing and SpaceX are under contract to fly a crew. And they're doing that, and I think the cargo program and I think crew are both on fixed price contracts as opposed to cost plus. So, you know, that's the number, and it's not uh, going to change. You know, the, the, what NASA would get is the restoration of uh, human space flight from U.S. soil. People forget the United States government right now does not have the ability to fly humans to space. We pay Russia to do it. We pay them about $84 million a seat. You know, sort of an irony there. Um, but it's been at a huge cost. But when, how do you get to that point where the government's not the only customer and it becomes a self-sustaining economy in space and that money's there, as you were talking about? That's a much more difficult problem. Yeah, although I also think um, governments benefit when society benefits. And so by the government investing in these endeavors, which are going to produce the types of technologies that you talk about, those technologies are then going to be utilized by entrepreneurs and societal businesses of the future, which are gonna feed our society, our tax base, all of those things. So if you think about the technologies that have come out of the original space race, we are a thriving society today because of many of those technologies. So there is a level of government investment where the return on that investment is a 100-year society that is thriving years from now, and that's that long view that we have to remind ourselves that you may not be able to draw a dollar line between the dollar they spent on SpaceX and the dollar they got back, but you can certainly draw a thriving line between society growing. I think it's, it, it's exactly the same situation as, uh, as Columbus trying to convince you know, Ferdinand and Isabel to fund his journey. They, he had no idea what would come in the wake of that journey. And I think that's kind of what you have to give it up to for space exploration is <clears throat> when we began space exploration, you know, 50s, late 50s, gosh, think how many technologies we have today. I don't have to talk to this crowd about spin-offs. But I mean, if you take alone communications, geospatial communications, uh, and Earth orbit, navigation, and communication, and my, for God's sake, don't take away the digital TV, you know, we'd all have fall apart and if we didn't have our phone. So, and then look to medicine, MRIs, most of all, I think materials science, you know, developing new materials that allow us to do inconceivable things previously. You know, I think those are where we're going to find that payoff. Right in the middle here on the right, blue shirt. Hi, thank you all for being here. Um, very much in the vein of his question, uh, my concern is, or my question rather, is how do we ensure that uh, the incentives of these private firms are aligned with that of the public when we're basically bankrolling their work. Um, when I was in school, a lot of my aerospace professors expressed the concern that um, over the last few decades, basically, NASA shrunk considerably and we're essentially privatizing the operations of NASA with you know, the side effect of maybe sending a few rich people to space. And these kind of stunts like the, the Tesla in space or the inverted pendulum landing, while neat, are uh, you know, kind of bolstering this Tony Stark image that gives them free reign to experiment in ways that may not necessarily benefit the public. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I don't think there's really any change in the way, in the quality of uh, control of space contracting from NASA or the government. I mean, I think in general, we as a populace can feel very confident 
that the money that our government is spending in aerospace and defense is being very carefully meted out and very carefully spent. I think the beauty of it is that instead of building a huge government cadre, we are in fact spending it in the commercial sector. And I think that's healthy, and I think you're getting a lot for your money. You know, I, I wonder real quickly about it, if you take it forward 10 years or 15 years and say, there's a company called Bigelow Aerospace that is putting up habitats and, uh, you know, private, so you got private destination, private vehicle to get there, then I think that might trigger some of your concerns. You know, who gets to go? How does that work? What's, you know, does it benefit the public? Uh, on the other hand, you know, this is America, right? I mean, people, you know, you got someone, you can do it, and you get someone to pay for it, go. And if you explore the alternative to not having the Tony Stark moments, and the we talked about that on the panel, if you don't have that inspiration, you know, you end up with this dearth of interest in pursuing these fields. And so there's got to be enough to keep people engaged and interested while also having it in an environment in which there's responsibility and how things are being done. And then there's this layer of saying it's going to come down. Technology always comes down to where it's accessible to many more people. And don't discount space tourism. I think you should all be raving for it and demanding it. I do, because I think it's going to be one of the things that's going to push us hard to, you know, to do better and to do more. Yeah. It's like the barnstorming. Then people wanted to take a ride on the little airplanes and go places. So, I, I mean, don't discount space tourism. One of our top questions um, submitted online here or voted online here is thinking globally, would this shift to private investment um, enhance or expedite international partnerships in space innovation? Question to Alex. I think it enhances it and I think it drives competition. I think, you know, all the money that's flowing into the U.S. space companies, which is significant, uh, I think other companies countries are seeing that and saying we, you know, maybe that's the way to go. And I think those governments are saying maybe we need a few billionaires and it'll, you know, help our bottom line. Well, I think the globalization is necessary. It's absolutely necessary. It's a very small planet. And to think that any one of us, you know, is going to rule in this area, no. It's too difficult and too expensive. We absolutely need one another. And when you see nations like the United Arab Emirates who are going to celebrate their 50th anniversary, and I think two years from now. And to, to celebrate that, they're gonna you know, have a mission fly around Mars. I mean, what more inspirational thing could there be? So we've got to do it together. I'm gonna slip into moderator mode for just a moment. I wanna push that just a, a little bit and ask, in science, we see international collaborations as absolutely that, strengthening us and helping us tackle the big projects. I'm curious from your work in the industry, I think we, as the public too often hear about international competition mm -hmm. and that we're competing mm -hmm. against one another. Is it a collaborative, we need each other environment or is it a competitive, we drive each other environment? At the scientists and engineers level, it's very collaborative in my ex total work experience. Mm -hmm. It's the international space station, Yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, you know, who knows what's going on geopolitically right between the US and Russia, but we're partners there. Yeah. That's very good. It's probably point. the strongest school we've had over these past 15, 18 years. Um, right up front, in the green dress or green shirt. Wait for the mic. <coughs> thank you. Uh, thank you so much for coming. I'm a Rocket City native, and I, I eat, sleep, and breathe space. So Rocket I'm just City, thrilled you're here. Rocket City, Alabama. For those of you who don't, <laughs> the Rocket yes, City. And I live in Chicago now. Uh, so my question is for the panel. Um, and I'd like to reference uh, Christian's book. So you mentioned the Space Barons, which are all um, these playboys that are in Us Weekly and People and have big personas and um, are known for many other things besides uh, their brilliance. You know, they're known for their wealth and all these other things. Who is in this arena that is maybe not a P.T. Barnum type personality? Who are the companies or individuals or women that are doing things um, kind of in the shadows? One of the things that you've seen, right, we do talk about a lot about the billionaires and their big rockets, right? They get a lot of attention. In their wake, you've seen a number of companies pop up. Uh, I mentioned Bigelow Aerospace that's building these inflatable habitats. I mean, they're like, they don't like, I don't think they like the word inflatable, <laughs> but that's what they are. Yeah. They get packed in there and they're like made out of Kevlar and they get to space and they become, 
these balloons, there's another company called Maiden Space. It's gonna do 3D printing. That has done it now on the space station um, and manufacturing in space. Um, so there's this industry that's popping up and we haven't even talked at all about uh, satellites. There's a company called Planet uh, that, you know, you think of a satellite, it's huge. It costs hundreds of millions of dollars. You know, the way the technology's gone, it's like how mainframe computers had, you know, took up a whole room to now you've got it essentially in your pocket. Satellites are now the size of a shoebox. Um, so you're seeing this industry really kind of take off with, with the hope that they can move faster and get to space more accessibly. There are hundreds, literally hundreds of companies doing different levels of things. Um, and they're regular, you know, cool engineers and scientists and just people that do it for love and do it for technology's sake, not necessarily for the money. Um, Dream Chaser, for example, you know, they're talking about a vertical launch, horizontal landing, and, you know, taking up nanosats as secondary payloads, uh, and eventually flying people. There are all kinds of people in this industry, hundreds of companies, literally. Do front row right here. So we, we've kind of been tackling this, obviously, from a heavily economic perspective, some economic government relationship, but it's all been primarily U.S.-centric other than the last couple questions. What does the ultimate regulatory framework look like to ensure that there are no bad actors? And we've already seen China, you know, shooting up a satellite and throwing up a debris field. How do we ensure that, you know, as a planet, we don't basically destroy this resource before we actually begin to take real advantage of it? Uh, that this was a big thing at the space symposium. Yeah, this is one of my favorite subjects. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I'll be quick then. I'll, I'll hand it to you. So uh, Secretary <laughs> Wilbur Ross started to talk about this. So the Commerce Department's going to take over, um, you know, sort of space traffic management. With commerce. Think about it. Yeah, Not the right. FAA, you know, commerce. Um, yeah, but that's a real concern. That 2007 uh, satellite put up a huge debris field. It's a real problem. There's a lot of debris up there and how you deal with that and create rules for the road in space. You know, right now, the Air Force, you know, is going to track all this debris and all the satellites, but they can warn you, hey, your satellite's going to get hit by this other satellite or this other piece of debris, but they don't have the ability to say, you must move your satellite. Mm -hmm. So just to put some numbers on what Christian said, the Air Force tracks 21,000 objects that are about the size of your palm, and there are 200,000 more that are smaller than that. So, you know, this space junk, it's not just a movie, it's a real thing, and it will impede our ability to access space, so it's critically important. On a higher order architecture, I think maybe more your question. You know, the space admiralty law and international space law is fledgling. We had the 1967 uh, Treaty for the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space out of the UN. That's pretty much the overarching thing we still have, and you know, UN has no teeth. There's no way anybody could reinforce any of that, even though everything it says is great and probably a good thing. Then well, we had the I Moon Treaty. Yeah. Well, you know, when the Chinese created that debris field. Yeah, well, pretty much without consequence. They're not the only sinners, well, that's for sure, <laughs> but yeah. Well, they got caught. I think it's a wonderful <laughs> area of study for any of you who are interested in <laughs> space law. It's a wide open, very young field of study. Good question. Any comments? Do right here. This gentleman right here. Can you describe in detail some of the industries or jobs that could really assist or benefit fr from this commercial opportunity? Uh, SpaceX, Blue Origin, all these companies on their website have job postings, and right, if you go on them, they're long. So you get a real good sense of what they're looking for. Yeah, it sounds like you're looking for a job. Yeah. <laughs> but what will surprise you is the breadth of talent that is needed to do this type of work. You may think that you need to be an electrical engineer or a mechanical engineer. That is not the case. You, they have talent pools of people that can do communications work, people that can do project management, quite frankly. It takes IT professionals. It takes, these are complex companies that are doing really sexy, big work, but it takes a lot of different talents, and I think that's one of the most exciting things to do, is to look at the job list and realize that you may not think you're in a 
profession that overlaps with space exploration, and I would guess that you probably do. When I was in college, JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, put out this marvelous spreadsheet that had all of the different jobs that they needed to run the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And there was dots and all, you could just study that spreadsheet forever to realize that they needed so many different talents. And so um, do go look at that list, because I think no matter what your profession, you'll be amazed at the fact that you can probably find yourself in SpaceX or Blue Origin. And Michelle's absolutely right. No matter what your interest, too, I mean, even in the arts, I try, it's like I tell the young people at Space Camp, for every person who flies, 40,000 more people are working in the industry in all kinds of jobs to make that happen. So plenty of room for everyone. All Another, right, we got a thumbs up. That was good. <laughs> Another popular question online, um, and this speaks to motive, um, regarding just the whole conversation we've been having. Is this a business decision or a cultural impulse to colonize and conquer? For the billionaires, you think, the these guys? Uh, you know, I think, I think in some ways it's both. Uh, although Elon took issue with that on, on Twitter recently, uh, saying this is really to advance humanity to, you know, um, pioneer and, and go through those frontiers um, and for the adventure of it. Uh, but in order to do that, you need a, a business that, you know, can thrive. I mean, even Jeff, who has, you know, how many, uh, $110 billion, at some point is going to need revenue to keep that going. So it's both. I mean, one supports the other. I think it's just primal. I think it's just built in our DNA to explore, to go to the next thing, to see what's over the ridge. I think it's just like our sexual impulse. I think it's just born in us, and we can't help it. We've got to do it, and it some takes guys with money to go first, but the rest of us really want to go, too. Uh, it's just inborn. Space and sex, there we go. <laughs> uh, right here in the front, on the right. Um, thanks for being here. Um, we've talked a lot about the business um, side of space, but I'm curious to get or hear what um, planetary missions and exploratory missions, either from NASA or the European Space Agency, what missions are exciting you guys? Which ones do you think um, have the biggest potential to um, further inspire us to go further into space? I'm waiting for the phone home moment from Pioneer. I mean, I just, you know, it's left the galaxy. And should we ever hear anything from it? I mean, wouldn't that be exciting? I don't know. What planetary missions are you interested in? Well, you know, and then there's the, was it Mars Insight that's going to launch, yeah. that's going to yeah. drill into Mars? Yeah. But I think really what it captures people's attentions is when there's humans involved. I mean, the, the robots, you know, Curiosity, th those are incredible. But when you put human beings on board, it's a whole other thing. So this gateway in cislunar space, if they're able to get that going, um, you know, that could be really interesting, and that's something that these billionaires are really interested in. I mean, both Elon and Jeff have talked about it. Blue Origin wants to build a lunar lander called Blue Moon to bring cargo and supplies ahead of a colony. I mean, as Jeff uh, said, and I think I had this in the paper, if not the book, you know, it's time to go back to the moon, but this time to stay. And what's key about that is, you know, there's been the discovery of water ice on the moon. Well, that's hydrogen and oxygen. That's that's rocket fuel, right? So then you think of the moon not just as a destination, but as a gas station and a launching off point. And one of the things I'm personally very excited about is mining. It, the ability to go out and to get rare earth metals and precious metals that we need here, I think, frankly, personally, I think that is going to be the economic driver that will turn it over so that space becomes you know, viable as a business. And the boring company is, you know, not just for doing a vacuum tube between San Francisco and L.A. The boring company has to do with asteroid, lunar mining, and so forth, too. But for planetary missions, I guess for me, I'm really looking forward to the James Webb Space Telescope. I mean, after the thrill of Hubble and we saw 200 billion galaxies that we've never seen before, and they think with James Webb we'll see 300 billion galaxies. I, I don't know. It's mind-boggling, so I'm looking forward to the launch of James Webb. And I think any of the ones that are looking at different environments, right, so exoplanets in particular, but being able to understand if there are other um, Earth-like planets around stars, but then also just different environments that help us learn more about environments on Earth. When we started finding water ice on Europa and oceans underneath, then we started thinking about how life could live in 
ultra cold environments on our own planet. And we started looking down into the depths of the hot pots in Yellowstone when we started realizing that there were hot places in the, in the solar system. So the missions that go out and try to find new environments, either in bodies in our own solar system or by watching planets around other stars, I think it's exciting to realize that there's a lot of different environments out there, but then we reflect back on the fact that there are still environments on our own planet that we haven't completely explored. Um, on the right, gentlemen, and then on the screen. Hello, uh, my question's for the whole panel. Uh, and I was really curious about, towards the end of the conversation, you were talking about uh, life-sustaining missions. And one of the most recent examples of that was the Kelly Brothers mission. And I was just curious what your guys' thoughts and insights into that were and some of the results that came out of that. I, I think what it showed is how incredibly difficult and how poorly suited we are as human, as little bags of water. Basically, that's what we are, right? We're bags of water. Uh, I mean, you know, now there are things not only, you know, we've talked about bone density for a long time and muscle mass loss and so forth. And I mean, when you think astronauts have to, and low Earth orbit, have to exercise two and a half hours a day. I mean, that starts to really put some framework around it. Most of us, you know, 30 minutes, we're lucky if we get it done, you know. But I think also now this uh, ocular pressure, the fact that they're discovering that, and changes in the DNA even. So, I, I mean, we've got a lot to learn about that. You should read its book, Endurance. It's yeah. fabulous. Yeah. Scott yeah. Kelly's yeah. book, it's really wonderful. It's yeah. so well done. That'll give you a lot of insight into that. And I became a physicist because biology is too hard, so biology in space <laughs> is even harder. So I agree. There's so much we don't know. So much we don't know. It's just fascinating. Um, to our council supporter in the space suit in the back. Um, Yay, you space said camp. 800,000 graduated. I'm a proud space camp um, graduate. Yes, me too. How many, how many other... How many others in the room are space camp graduates? Yes, yay. Oh, they're all sitting together, so yeah. it's the cohort. It's my family, Doctor. <laughs> That's my family, Oh, okay. Doctor. I didn't go when I was nine. I went when I was uh, 40. And so I want you to know there is adult space camp. You have a history camp. Yes. Uh, but I also want to know, and, and I think it's fantastic that we have two women on stage talking about space and science. And as the mom of two daughters, what we can do with to specifically encourage not just, I know we need a whole workforce, but specifically to encourage young women to take a look at STEAM education and, and our girls will go to space camp, but beyond that, like what else could we be doing and what brought you to where you are? I think, biology was too hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, biology was too, I think as scientists we do a horrible job at actually helping people understand what science is as a career. Um, as a career, it is problem solving and, you know, really difficult and exciting questions that we try to figure out. And it takes, as I already mentioned over here, a variety of talents and teamwork and creativity to tackle these really interesting mysteries and problems. And who wouldn't want to do that? And there's so many different things to be tackled that you don't have to pigeonhole yourself into something you're not that interested in. Whatever you're interested in, Probably we don't know enough about it and we could use your help. So I think the first step is being better at describing what the process and the career of being a scientist or an engineer or a technologist really is. It's not about repeating things that we already know are done so that we can affirm that we've learned the tools. We have to do that. We need the tools. You're going to need the tools. But that's not what science is in being a scientist. So we're working very hard at the Adler to try to do a much better job at engaging people in the work of science, the work of discovery, the work of engineering, so that people can see themselves and find themselves. So I didn't know I wanted to become a scientist until I was 24 years old, mm -hmm. because I didn't realize that it was mysterious and fun and a curiosity-driven endeavor that I needed to bring my own particular life path and experience set to the table to help the team that was already there solve those problems. So I think that's one thing that can really help is to be more accurate about what's needed. Christian, I'm interested in your view. I'm going to bring my girls to space camp. Yeah. We, we were talking about this backstage. Well done. Um, and you know, <laughs> while we focus a lot on the, the billionaires in space, I mean, let's not forget, you know, one of the most important people at SpaceX is Gwen Shotwell. Oh yes. You know, who, you know, she's a she's a dynamo, and people say that, you know, Elon doesn't have a Gwen at Tesla. Yeah. 
right? And she's been with him since from the very beginning. She's a force. She's really smart and is a big advocate, too, for, for women and, and promoting women at SpaceX, yeah. too. She was selected for the NASA Distinguished Public Service Award at the yeah. same time I was. And so that shows you, I mean, she's, NASA doesn't select industry people that are on their payroll, you know, without some really good cause. Yeah. I think, too, it's partially, it's just giving it enough time, and I, I, giving it enough time to have women emerge. So, you know, when you think back that, well, Sally Ride went up in the 80s, you know, it hasn't been a long time. It's like when I joined the Navy. You know, I was one of the first women that went on ships. It takes time for them to grow into the management roles. And I think, you know, not to excuse the number that there are now, but <clears throat> when we see people like Sally Ride, like Peg Whitson, who's got more time and space than anybody else right now, you know, when we, when we feature those women and show them as role models, as Michelle said, to, to see those people succeeding in those areas. And, you know, if you haven't heard it, I'm really thrilled to tell you that the new director of the National Air and Space Museum, Ellen Stofan, is a woman and is a NASA scientist. So I think the more we get them in visible positions, the more our daughters will see them. And, and be careful that I your daughters that. understand that they're not expected to be these people now. They're, they're these people as these people were when they were them, yeah. right? I was. I was mucking around in mud puddles, sailing cardboard boxes in Turkey when the rains would come when I was your, you know, our daughter's ages. And so I think we have that problem too, is that we hold these people up and say, look, you could be her, and they think I could never be her. Well, you could, because when she was 12, this is what she was doing. And so we have to remind everybody that it's steps, take steps. I think that's a fantastic question to end on. Sadly, we don't have any more time for more questions. Um, I will remind you all that um, Christian's book is on sale, and he will be available to um, sign it if it's purchased right over here. Um, the bar will reopen. We'll um, have a brief reception, so please feel free to stick around, grab a drink, um, have some space dialogue. I think our speakers will stay around for um, just a few moments here. And before you head out, please join me in thanking our fantastic panel. This was a great conversation.